Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you want to start introducing you in, yourselves in the chat, please do. You can either join the poll via the link in the chat or you can uh, go to slido.com and then put the code hashtag PCW2023. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for filling that in. So I think you can all see the results as well. Uh, a few of you are thinking of setting up a platform co-op. That's really exciting. Um, some of you are interested from a point of view of research and others are here just to, to find out a bit more. So welcome everyone. Um, so if we're running this webinar in webinar format. So unfortunately we're unable to see you, um, but we will be monitoring the chat. So please, please do you know use the chat either to, to ask questions um, or, or comment or also to, to comment between you. Um, my colleague Jen is uh, with us, so she's looking at she'll be looking at the chat. So if you need any help, she'll be able to, to respond even while um, I'm talking. Thanks, Jen, for all your support. Um, so what we'll cover today. So my name is Vika Rogers. I work for Cooperatives UK uh, and I've been focusing on this area of platform co-ops for, for quite some years now. Um, and so I'll be going over what we mean by a platform co-op, um, how to start one and what support is available. And then I'll be followed by um, two excellent speakers that it's really great to have with us today. So we've got Jen, Jennifer Bird, who's the founding member of Signalize, which is a sign language interpreting services, service that uses a digital platform to connect its members who are deaf people, British sign language interpreters and service user organizations. And we have Kaylee Reed, who is a member of Open Food Network, which is a co-op of organizations whose members collectively own and control an innovative software platform that they use to trade um, food they produce. So I'll be talking more generally about platform co-ops, and then we'll get the chance to really talk with the people who are running them, which is really exciting. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A at the end. OK, so I'm going to get started. Um, so just to make sure that we're on, on the same page, because some of you might be experts in, in co-ops, others might be the first time you hear about co-ops, I just wanted to give a quick definition or description of what we mean by co-op. Um, so first of all, a cooperative is a business organization that's owned and controlled by its members to meet their shared needs. The members can be of very different types. It can be customers, employees, residents, residents, suppliers, and they all have a say in how the co-op is run. Cooperatives can be in any sector, so here we've listed some, um, and more than 7,000 co-ops contribute over 40 billion to the UK economy. Members are the foundation of every co-op, and that's the reason they exist, and the purpose drives who the members should be and vice versa. Members choose what to do with the profits and they are the owners of the co-op and they can invest to benefit from the co-op, but they can't invest just to make money. And members have an equal say in the co-op. Um, so moving on to what we mean by a platform co-op, um, we've described what we mean by co-op. I wanted to give a bit more of a description of what we mean by platform. Now, platform is a broad term and there isn't a very specific definition to it, but it's a term that has been used by sort of the tech uh, business sector to describe a phenomenon that was starting in, in the last decade um, of new business models forming that were determined by the fact that trade was happening on platforms um, digitally. So this is a definition that I tend to use, which is a platform a business is a business that uses a digital platform to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. Um, now, we are all probably more and more aware of these types of platforms and they become so much more dominant in our life. 
Uh, they help us to connect with friends. They help us to order food, to uh, book a taxi, etc. And this air, the, this these type of businesses are growing and becoming more dominant in our life. And especially following the the COVID crisis, during the COVID crisis, we all realized how how important they were to help us continue to to deliver our activities, and to and connect with people. But unfortunately, we've also learned that there are a lot of downsides. Um, of these platform businesses. So I'm just going to go through some of them. You're probably mostly aware, um, but just to, to provide some context. Um, so unfortunately, platforms um, often, um, they collect and hold large amounts of user data, and but it's not always clear what they do with that data, uh, and they don't always disclose it. And they often use uh, algorithms that might contain bias and that skew the way the platforms operate. Platforms gain immense power to, due to the amount, huge amounts of data they hold and the large profits that they make. Um, and the, the platforms also give the, the businesses uh, uh, a, a lot of power over the users. And so they can unilaterally introduce changes that can impact users, for example, changing our hourly rates or simply deactivating a user from one day to the other, which can result with more or less in firing them. Um, they also have had a, a, a strong impact on communities and workers' rights. So platforms tend to facilitate dependency on precarious income streams and working conditions. They, tend, they have often created obstacles or openly opposed collective action, and they can have um, negative impacts on local communities by introducing disruptive uh, economic practices. And something that I think is not emphasized enough is also that they really uh, are good at exploiting uh, crises. So um, they definitely benefited from the high un unemployment rates and low wages that followed the financial crisis and did again so in, with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, they tend to have um, a, a extractive uh, business model uh, that extracts disproportionate value from other people's assets and labor while offering them limited rights. And they tend to be driven towards exponential growth also due to their aggressive funding models, which are based on very often on venture capital. And to reach this exponential growth, um, platforms often tend to uh, aim to become a single provider of a service across the globe by destroying or buying up their competitors, but also aggressively lobbying government and, and, and attempt to anticipate or circumvent a regulation. So this uh, all sounds terrible and very worrying. Um, but what, when I started working on this, what really inspired me about the platform co-op movement was the fact that what were the question that it was posing, which was, is it really technology the root cause of these problems, or is it the business model on which they're built? And what would happen if we instead these businesses, these platforms were collectively owned by their users, by their members, and democratically controlled by them. Um, and that's exactly what a co-op is. It's a business that's collectively owned and democratically controlled. So if we go back to what a definition of a platform co-op is, um, by merging these two definitions that I gave at the beginning, we, we can say that a platform co-op is a democratically owned and controlled business that uses an online platform or mobile app to trade, connect people and or pool resources and data. Um, so for example, just imagine if Deliveroo was owned uh, and, and managed by its riders or if Spotify was owned and, and run by its musicians or listeners or Airbnb by um, it hosts or local communities. And what's really exciting about the platform co-op movement is that it's producing alternatives um, to these uh, large um, platforms. So Co-op Cycle is an international platform for cycle couriers. Um, Resonate is a platform uh, for uh, musicians and listeners. Uh, and Airbnb, uh, Fairbnb is a community powered tourism platform. And there are many more um, emerging. So 
platform co-ops operate according to the cooperative principles that I've listed here. I won't go into detail, but we've got lots of information on our website about it. And what is interesting for me is that the principles not only define how the business is run, but they can shape also the way technology is used and determine how data is collected and processed. Um, it, I also think that the co-op movement can learn a lot from the, um, the, plat the, the potential that platforms can, can offer. Um, and first of all, technology allows um, startups costs to be relatively low. Um, it allows uh, direct um, uh, people to people connections are made easier. Members can choose how much they want to use or provide a service and uh, collective participation is more practical, practical also from the point of view of participating democratically in processes. Barriers for members to join and participate are low and the net network effect provided by, 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 network, by technology allows us to, to scale these organizations uh, more rapidly. Um, so here are some examples of uh, UK-based platform co-ops. I won't talk about uh, Sinalize because we'll hear more about them later. Um, uh, I tend to divide platform co-ops in, in two types. Uh, one is where the platform really allows to connect the providers of a service and the receivers of, of, of a service. And I've just put um, some quotes here from these organizations and I'll just read one of them, which is from Equal Care. We want to see a care and support system which puts the relationship between giver and receiver first, shares power and allows care and support to exist in, in abundance. And what I think is really interesting is that not only is the platform model being challenged by these organizations, but also the, the power relations between the providers and receivers of the of services and how they interact with, with third parties as well. Um, another form of platform carb I tend to group them in, in, under infrastructure co-ops, uh, where the platform really provides infrastructure then to smaller organizations, either, interna either internationally or, um, or nationally. Uh, we'll hear more about the Open Food Network later, but another really good example is Co-op Cycle, where the platform is owned internationally by local worker co-ops of riders uh, across Europe. Um, Okay, I'm just going to move on now to how to start a platform co-op. Um, I've provided a lot of information, so please, you know, do start typing your questions in, in, the, in the chat if you don't want to forget them, uh, and I'll try to respond to some of your questions at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, so, the information I'm going to provide now is uh, based on the work I've been doing uh, over the last uh, three years of supporting people in starting their platform co-op, uh, but also sort of monitoring um, the landscape um, in the past few years. However, every co-op is different. It doesn't always have to go in this way. Um, so this is just really to provide some general guidance and a sense of, of, of what the patterns we're seeing, but it's, it doesn't have to be in this way for, for every co-op. Um, so we've sort, I've sort of mapped the journey of a platform co-op startup um, on the sort of traditional setup pre-seed seed language that is used with, with digital um uh startups which is probably actually starting to get a bit old as well um but we can see that there's a a really early stage phase that i think often is just underestimated how long it can be um in which really there's a lot of time in exploring what the business case is what the business model could be found it finding your your uh, founding members um one thing that is really important in a co-op is that you can't start a co-op by yourself you need to be a group of people at least two three to start um to start a co-op because it's all about building something together with other people um and then you get to the phase that you're ready to incorporate you have your founding members your purpose and you're ready to incorporate and register as a co-op um, then there's a phase that probably starts much earlier uh, uh, before incorporation that is testing your business idea, starting with your prototypes, um, building your tech and building 
the business and understanding all the processes that you need for that. Um, and then you get to the a point that you'll need more capital uh, to grow or to stabilize the, the, the co-op. And what we've seen happen in the UK is co-ops um, going for what we call community shares, which is a form of capital that is very uh, unique um, to the UK. Um, and it's a form of very patient capital, but also um, it doesn't matter how many shares one holds in a company, they only have one vote. So it's a really good way of sort of attracting big investors, but without having to, to um, give away uh, too much decision power. Um, and then obviously then there are a series of cycles of growth and cycling. Um, there's a link that uh, we've just put in the chat that you will see a much more in detailed uh, journey uh, that you can just scroll through. Again, this is very sort of patterns of what we've seen up to now. Um, uh, so don't take it too literally. So from the point of view of funding, what we've observed is that in that pre-year before uh, you actually become a company, often founders are able to, to attract either through crowdfunding or, or in uh, fellowships or founder grants around £15,000. Once you incorporate and that you're able to accept grants from institutions, then we see sort of um, co-ops attracting around £75,000 in, in grants. And then when you get you're ready to to launch a community share offer, there's a huge jump, and we see co-ops raising between two hundred and three hundred and fifty thousand um, pounds. Um, I'm not going to go into detail with regards to community shares. We have a lot of information on our on our website, um, but happy to answer any questions um, later in the Q and A if needed. And this is just some examples of of um, community uh, share investments. Um, you can see the first ones were really from the more uh, media platform co-ops, um, but then in the most recent years, we've seen more infrastructure co-ops um, and um, uh, provider and, and, and a service provider um, um, co-ops as well. Um, what is also interesting is what I mentioned was that you can attract large investors as well. Um, and what we've seen is that some, not many, but some grant funders are also interested in investing in community shares and providing match funding to what you're able to, to raise from, from the community. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through the support that's available for platform co-ops before I hand it over to the other speakers. Um, so, the main program that we have to support platform co-ops is called Unfound. Um, I, I, I currently run this program, um, so you can get in touch with me at unfound at uk.coop. The main uh, the program is run from Cooperatives UK and supported uh, by the Cooperative Bank. Um, the main activities of the program are, is really business support, um, but we also do awareness raising around um, not only platform co-ops, but also tech and co-ops more broadly. Uh, we've spent time, you know, trying to see which um, funding streams could come to the sector and a little bit of time on policy, but that's probably the, the least work we've done in this area at this point. Um, what we are doing as business support is uh, an accelerator program. Uh, we run it once a year and we are actually accepting applications now until the 5th of March for the next uh, accelerator. It's a 10 week business support program for a cohort of up to um, eight to 12 teams, which are at the really, really early stage of setting up their platform co-op. Um, and the business support concludes with a pitch event where um, teams get a chance to pitch their business idea to access funding and support uh, towards which the cooperative bank has contributed a 10,000 prize fund. So to access the, to be eligible for the uh, program, you need to have a team of at least two members that are at the, the early stage of setting up their, their platform co-op. You have to believe that the co-op model is the right for your um, form for your business, but also you need to be uh, at a stage that you're really looking to register in the UK by the end of 2023. And it, and we have to have at least one member 
in the UK. It can't be a platform car being set up um, abroad. So um, the deadline, as I mentioned, is the 5th of March. Uh, these are the dates of the accelerator. Um, we will also have two specific webinars um, that are really just specific to the accelerator, where you can ask any questions about the accelerator. I think I've got the dates right, but we've, I think we've got them in the chat as well, the 30th, 23rd of January and the 21st of February. If you want to keep up to date with anything related to, to Unfound, do register our, uh, with our newsletter. Um, I also provide information about funding opportunities and events around tech and co-ops. So that's really a, a useful place to, to register. And then uh, we're going to put in the chat a few more links uh, related to, to where you can find inf more information about Unfound. But what is really interesting, uh, oh, sorry, but I, before I go on to that, um, we also have other support available, um, which isn't targeted specifically at platform co-ops, but it is available all year round, while the accelerator is only in certain times of the year. Uh, one is this step-by-step uh, -step tool that is really useful in helping you go through the various steps needed uh, before you're ready to, to register your co-op. And then there's also support available for you to register and incorporate your, your business. Um, we also have other support programs. Um, so we have a business support um, for co-ops program that will offer up to six days of bespoke one-to-one -one business support and peer mentoring from other co-ops. This isn't live yet on our website, but will be live in the next two weeks, probably. So, you know, if you're interested, do, do look back on our website in relation to that. Um, our advice team is always um, available. Um, they provide a lot of services, but also a lot of training sessions. Um, so it's a really good way to sort of just get to, to learn some aspects uh, at your own pace. And then, as I mentioned, we we do a lot of work around community shares and we have a community shares unit with their own area on our website where you can find a lot of information about um, the support available, the funding available, but also information about how community shares work. Um, but what is also very exciting about the co-op movement in general and um, platform co-ops is that um, the movement is international. And so there's quite a strong international movement uh, around platform co-ops. Um, so do visit the website platform.coop, which is run by one of the founders, Trevor Schultz from the New School, School of New York. Um, they run events, courses, um, opportunities to connect with people, uh, founders of platforms in other countries. Uh, exchange skills, exchange knowledge. They also have a newsletter, which is worth subscribing to. Um, and also uh, some interesting international lists where you can be kept up to date and, and, and participate in the discussions if you're interested. That's all from me. I'll put this slide up at the end as well, where just to remind people of where you can find some more information. Um, but I think now it would be really nice to hear from uh, the other platform co-ops and I'll stop talking <laughs> at last. Um, so I'll hand it over you, to you, Jen, if that's okay. So Jen Bird from uh, Signalize. It's great to have you here, thanks. Thanks, Vika, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just start sharing my slides. Um, so yeah, I'm Jen Bird from Signalize Co-op. We're a platform co-op. We're a multi-stakeholder -stake cooperative of deaf users and sign language interpreters, and we also have investor members. So I'll just talk you through that. The reason why we were set up is because the sign language interpreting profession has come across a lot of problems, especially since around 2010. So the austerity era after the financial crash. Um, this is one of the all too common stories that we tend to hear about at least once a month, where family members are used as interpreters in hospitals because either the staff don't know who holds the contract or there is no contract. It could be a variety of reasons. So these are as an explanation of some of those parts of the problem. Um, quite often those large private agencies, they could be uh, sign language specialists 
or they could be large spoken language agencies or national charities. Quite often, the larger the agency, the worse the problem. So there's more and more distance from the users that are involved, whether that's the workers or the end users, the receivers of the service, so the deaf people. Um, and because those agencies are very profit driven, it's what Vika was explaining about the extractive model. That profit is not seen again by the community. It's taken out of the the interpreting booking process and it tends to either fund other services or it lines shareholders profits. Um, so I'll go on to talk about what we do as a co-op to uh, mitigate against that. But quite often with um, there's layers of the process with interpreting and the bookings process where in one particular region there could be many providers of interpreting and the users aren't aware of who holds the contract for their GP or their hospital or the community um, service which provides many community services such as physio or podiatry it can be held by many many different providers and this leaves users in a state of not knowing who they should contact if there's a problem quite often they can't contact anyone other than the medical service um, who then sometimes don't even know who to contact or who holds the service so there's too many layers of administration and not enough connection with the community that causes a lot of these problems and often users um, have a have an appointment and even when they're on the way to the, their appointment they don't know who's coming um, there's no communication with the user at all it's more of a bums on seats approach or a tick box exercise in providing interpreting where perhaps a trust has a contract, but the user never gets to know who's going to be arriving on the day, which um, according to research by Sign Health causes a lot of anxiety. And it also can cost up to 30 million a year in NHS funds in wasted appointments or misdiagnosis. So it's a really big problem. So for us as a platform cooperative, how we mitigate against this, these problems are by doing it in a different way. So not doing the extractive model, but using um, profits. We're not actually making a profit yet because we're investing so much into our tech, but the plan in the future is to invest those profits back into the service by working with users or um, by working with interpreters to improve standards or by reinvesting in the business itself. As, as we are community owned as well, we have that unique way of tapping into our communities with the members themselves to ask them if there's any problems with the service. So we get that immediate feedback either via our quarterly meetings with both service user, with both groups of members, or at any point at all by um, them being able to feedback to staff. And as the experts in delivering or receiving the service, we know best we're directly involved and we have the we have the answers and if there are problems in service delivery we can come together and talk about those and solve them amongst ourselves so this is just a bit about our journey which very much reflects on what Vika was saying um, we started in March 2019 as a small group of interpreters and deaf users and uh, did our community shares raise in June 2021 in August 2021, only two months later, we were awarded um, the place as a sole provider on a large framework agreement on Merseyside. So that was for up to 19 NHS trusts, and we're now on contract number seven as of December. So hopefully we'll be gaining a few more this year. And we see that we fit very much into the post-COVID economy where social value is placed very highly, or certainly more highly than it has been before. Um, so there's been the, in 2012, the Public Services Social Value Act, and also many more commissioning guidelines, whether locally or nationally, uh, for interpreting or otherwise. Um, so the framework that we were successful in actually had social value embedded um, quite highly throughout the questions on that tender, so we were able to score quite highly on those. The interpreting market is hugely competitive, so we're really up against it, whether it's from the video interpreting companies, which are pretty much all American owned now, or whether it's those large spoken language agencies. So quite often sign language um, as a provision is lumped in against many other spoken languages, whether that's Russian, um, Hindi or so forth. So 
which is why those that specialist knowledge is being lost by those providers. But as a platform cooperative, we can retain that knowledge and retain that expertise and prove we're the best at delivering the service. But as a platform cooperative, what we're really investing in is the tech side, whether that's our um, video service that we've created or whether it's the platform itself, which the NHS are, are using at present. And we want to expand the use of that in future. So that's a little preview of our booking platform. It's still in beta, but the majority of the interpreters that work in the Merseyside area and um, the surrounding areas where interpreters come into Merseyside to work are on the platform. Um, the percentage of members in certain parts of Merseyside, we have 100% of interpreters that are available are members of the co-op. In some other areas, it's around 70 or 80. So we're working hard to try and get to that 100% in all areas of Merseyside. Um, so the benefit to users is deaf users is that they can log on to the platform and state their preferences. So they can, you can see, I think Karen's got one heart there. <laughs> so users can actually go and click and tell us who their favorite interpreters are. And in future, we'll be building a list where people can say who they don't want to work with, because some people have some strong views about who they don't want to turn up at their appointments, which is fair enough for something so personal. Um, so these profiles are all live and it's one of the first times the interpreting profession has had this kind of technology. It's, it's failed in the past, partly, well, mainly because it didn't get buy-in from the interpreters or the deaf users necessarily. So as a, as a co-op, we're building it ourselves. So we're gaining direct feedback from the interpreters as to the features that they require or what the features that the deaf users require. So we're very um, flexible in that sense. Um, and when a deaf user has an appointment that's been confirmed, so for example, if Mr. Bloggs has an appointment at 10 a.m. tomorrow and um, it's been the booking's been made on the platform, the staff have facilitated some of the back end stuff that they do manually at the minute, which is more and more automation is coming. Um, the deaf user gets a text message with a link to the interpreter's profile. So for the very first time in the history of interpreting, the user directly has a confirmation of the date and the time of their appointment, appointment and who is coming and a link to further information. So some users in the past have been told by hospitals as to who's coming, but there's no further information given. Whereas we have that direct, we inbuilt into our service, that direct ability to talk to the user and ensure that we, we take those preferences and we confirm it. And we've had great feedback from um, our members and also the wider deaf community that aren't yet members about how reassuring that is. Um, so in the early days of this uh, last year, we had um, an interpreter arrive at an appointment and a deaf user said, oh, your face flashed up on my phone yesterday. Um, and I didn't I didn't quite realise, was it from the doctor? And the interpreter was like, can I see that message, please? And the deaf user showed them the message and it was the, the text message from us. And um, because it was a smartphone, their face actually flashed up because the link was to their profile online. So this is one of our um, USPs. It's one of our success stories. Private companies don't necessarily do this because it's something that's not going to bring them extra profit necessarily. So this is these kind of initiatives are being born out of a community driven business, which we're very proud of. And we built a video interpreting service. It's not American owned, it's community owned. Um, it's very much in its early stages. It's a lot of hard work, but users also benefit greatly from this. So for example, deaf users can now um, call their GP during COVID especially, and um, prior to then, deaf users were having to physically go to their GP surgery, perhaps write on a piece of paper to ask them to book an appointment. So um, you or I might pick up a phone and, <clears throat> excuse me, just call the surgery and book in an appointment. There has been no facility, partly due to information and governance um, nas and national directives by NHS England, deaf users aren't allowed to text or email GP surgeries They've, according to their governance. So they actually have to physically go into those surgeries. Um, but what they can do now 
with us is use the video interpreting service to directly call those GPs that we have a contract with on Merseyside in order to, and the interpreter on the, so you can see on the second box there, there's only uh, two people on that call, but if a deaf user were on the call, there'd be three. Actually, no apologies. You can see right at the bottom, there's um, the interpreter view, and then there's two other people. So it's a three-way video call where, um, somebody can be connected to a GP surgery and make their appointment. It's also been really useful to use in out of hours. So um, more recently, uh, a deaf user was on a hospital ward and rather than waiting for an interpreter to turn up in the middle of the night, was able to access an urgent scan immediately because they were connected to the video service and an interpreter facilitated that communication. So for us, it's about reviewing our strategy next, making sure um, our existing strategy is still fit for purpose and increasing in business. For us, this is now the time to grow and scale and continue to evolve um, the platform and the video service app, both of which are incredibly important for us. Um, we're also doing more um, outreach work. So we have an outreach worker who um, is going out into the community and basically helping users understand the platform. Um, on Merseyside, as around the country, many deaf users don't even have a smartphone or a laptop or a device. So we're trying really hard to work with users who do have devices and to um, help users who don't uh, to, to access the service as well. Um, we've also got a lot of work to do on our co-op development side on the government's governance and the membership, just to keep make sure that as we're scaling and increasing our membership, that all members can access the co-op and know how to input into it. So um, we have a lot of work to do over the next few years, but this is basically where we're up to. Um, so if you do want to contact us, I'm happy to answer any questions. As I haven't seen any come through, I don't think, in the chat, but I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And um, if you do want to contact us, there's our contact details. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'd really encourage people to use the chat even from now for questions because I realize that um, we're getting very quickly through the hour. So yeah, do use the chat if you have questions now and we'll be trying to respond to them um, while, while Kaylee's also talking. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Kaylee from Open Food Network. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and get my slides up. One second. Cool. Um, okay, so I'm from the Open Food Network UK. We're a global collaboration um, of essentially people all around the world who are um, driven by creating systemic change in our food systems. And the Open Food Network was founded in 2012 in Australia, and now it's an international community, but it's locally led. So even though you can kind of see us as being like a network of networks around the world um, or a co-op of co-ops, and then each local instance in each country is kind of um, organized on a local level. But then also that kind of feeds into like our global vision as a wider community as well. And also all of the resources that we create on a local level is then um, also accessible to the whole global community. Um, we operate in just over 20 countries and more join us every year, which is really exciting. So we're always growing. Um, and essentially we're working together to develop shared resources, knowledge um, and software to support a better food system. Our software is actually our flagship project, but it's not the only thing that we do. And it's an open source software platform that can be used for food enterprises to set up an online shop. Um, but it's designed specifically to enable collaboration between food enterprises and food producers, etc. Um, and lots of people have used the power of this feature to create food collectives, food hubs and to take farmers markets online and then also independent food producers have also used it to be able to put their produce online as well um, but we're more than just a software um, we're a co-learning community that focuses on innovative solutions to solving food system problems and also um, we're a community not just a business so we're a co-op and we operate sociocratically So I'm going to talk a bit about the Open Food Network UK, um, but just also one of the um, great things about being an open source technology is that it's not owned by anyone. And that means that anyone can contribute and um, you can build a community around the software. 
and also being open source tackles some of the problems that you can see and that um, Vika explained earlier on around the problems with intellectual property rights, um, what happens to people's data and also capitalism. And so our vision is the Open Food Network, Kate, and this is also maybe a shared vision for all of us, is a world in which every person has sufficient access to high quality food that's produced in a way that regenerates the planet. Um, because some of the problems that we're seeing in the, the way that the current food system um, operates, we're seeing massive social and economic inequalities, um, environmental devastation, um, with the use of pesticides and more, um, issues uh, of carbon production around the um, really long, complex supply chains in the current food system, um, and transportation costs, um, also the production of fertilizers, um, the production of nitrate food fertilizers constitutes a massive um, carbon output. Um, also, the, these long, fragile uh, supply chains are quite fragile. So we saw in um, COVID, empty shelves in the supermarkets, which just shows that when, you know, if they're, if they're increasing, as we might be seeing more kind of global um, issues, that these fragile supply chains can break down. When if a supply chain is owned on a local level, it's a lot more solid. Um, also issues around food waste and um, producers struggling to be able to continue to produce food with the margins that they're given, for example, by the supermarkets. And so the Open Food Net UK, we, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about our founder's journey, but I'm not a founder. I joined the Open Founder about three years ago, so I might not do it as much justice. Um, uh, but it was founded by um, Sarah, uh, Sarah, Nick and Lynn. And they all came together to improve software that they were using for their food enterprises at the time. Um, so actually bring it, uh, and then they um, knew about the software that was that was being created by the Open Food Network in Australia, and then brought that to the UK. Um, so the Open Food Network UK was founded by people who were embedded in the movement towards better local food systems, and have been working in that area um, for about, you know, I think each of them for like decades. Um, so really embedded in, in the movement towards better food systems. So first of all, when we launched, we gained funding from Esme Fairburn for the first three years. And then the pandemic hit a few years ago. So things were quite kind of um, very small scale for the Open Food Network in the initial um, six or seven years. And then when the pandemic hit, we saw a massive growth, um, over a thousand percent growth over a few weeks, which was quite intense. Um, but that also led to more funding. So since then, we've really expanded the team and we've grown now. I think there's about 12 of us, um, which is really exciting for us in the coordination circle. Um, so um, but outside of that, we also consider part of our cooperative, um, the food enterprises that use our software as well. So um, but we have a central coordination team of which we have 12 members that are doing kind of things like um, software support, marketing for the OFN, creating resources for our community, um, and lots of different things as well. Um, and all of the funding opportunities that we gained since um, COVID has really helped us to, to grow and build our reputation in the movement. Um, this is what our software platform opening page looks like, and you can use it to, so if you're a shopper for local food, you, if you're an enterprise, you can use it to set up um, your own enterprise and it's free at the point of use. We only start charging if you um, trade over 500 pounds per month. So it's a really great way for um, food enterprises to get online at no cost. Um, and we also have the ability for shoppers to um, search in their local area what food enterprises around them. So you can see here our map. Um, and our vision is for more diverse food systems, um, agroecological production of food and healthy communities. And I wanted to talk a bit about um, I've mentioned before that we're not just a software platform. Um, one of the things that I joined the OFN to do was to create more resources for our community. So I did a lot of kind of one-to-one -one consultations with food enterprises um, individually, and then whatever was learned from that was then rolled out in resources for the rest of the community. Um, and then also that's something that's happening on a global level. So in each of the different instances around the world, if we're creating resources or, and that can be resources, anything from marketing, how to's through to accounting, how to, pretty much anything that would help a local food enterprise to thrive, that's kind of bounced back into the community for anyone to be able to use. Um, so everything that we do is essentially used to help um, or support all the members of our community but it's all free to access so even if you're not part of the open food network you can use and access our resources as well 
And so something I wanted to just say about what's great about being a platform cooperative is that um, what we're doing is grown from the real needs of food, hub and, food hubs and farmers across the UK and globally, because it's been created by people who are. Um, most of the people in the Open Food Network are um, have been or are running food enterprises themselves. Um, and also building software with social aims is sometimes difficult to fund, but our funding model spreads the cost. So a nice example of this is that we've identified recently that we really need to improve our subscriptions offering. Um, so, for example, um, making it easier for um, our software users to set up a VegBox subscription option on the platform. Um, and now that we've identified that, we've been able to talk to the whole global community and pull our resources together to create an action plan to apply for funding for that software feature. So it means that if one um, instance identifies a need, then we can pull, and if it is useful for the rest of global community, we can kind of pull our resources and work together to gain funding to, to improve, improve what we're offering. Uh, and how we organize in OFN UK, each instance um, around the world organizes maybe slightly differently, but all based on sociocratic um, and cooperative principles. But for us in the OFN UK, we're non-hierarchical, we're a sociocracy, a holacracy. All of our decisions are made by consent um, and we prioritize transparency. Um, operating like a sociocracy means that we have we operate as a circle structure so the coordination circle of all 12 of us is the the main circle but then within that we have different circles um, that essentially have not ownership is the wrong word but like are empowered to work in their sphere of um, zone of genius I guess without need yeah um, I could explain a bit more about that but I'm just aware of the time um, we've been on a bit of a journey over the last year of really um, working on our governance structure uh, together and how we operate as a sociocracy, what that means. And um, it's been a really interesting process for every member of the team. Um, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, um, that's it from me. Thank you, Kaylee, for that. Really interesting as well. Um, I'm just going to leave a bit of time. If anyone wants to add any questions in the chat, please do. Um, really sorry not to be able to see you all. Uh, it's just a webinar format. <laughs> it's what it is. Um, so yeah, do please um, put some questions if you have them. Um, there's a question about how do platform co-ops in general relate to open source software. So I'll just give a general response and then maybe Kaylee, you can expand on that as well from the point of view of Open Food Network. Um, so, so when I, in the Unfound Accelerator, what I tend to distinguish but, um, of the platform co-op business is sort of three layers. Uh, one is the business. One is the tech infrastructure and what, what it's built, and one is the data uh, that is collated and, and managed and so on. And it's really up to each platform co-op how they manage those things and how open all three of them are or how uh, managed uh, the membership and the use of, the, of them is, um, and also how true to their values they can be with all three. So it might be that you can be like, okay, 100% co-op values uh, from the point of view of the business, but at the start, you might need to start using proprietary software just to test your business case. The idea would be that you can build all your own software, but some might just need to be using, you know, even Google Forms at the start or things like that to just test your, to your business case. Um, and so it's really up to the co-op then to decide how much they want, for example, their software to be open, how much they want their data to be open, how much do they want their membership to be to, to be open, or how much they want it to remain um, controlled so they can manage it in a different way. And so from the point of view of software, we've seen different cases. We've got Open Food Network that is mostly open source. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Kaylee, I'll, I'll hand it over to you afterwards. But I think it's the brand that it's licensed rather than, than the software. But I'll let you feel that, talk more about that. We've seen others like Co-op Cycle where um, the software is only can only be used by other co-ops. Um, they won't allow other people to use it. 
And then we have um, the mobility factory, which is actually for electric cars. And there it's a network of, of local organizations that you can use to rent cars. And for them, the software is preparatory and only for the members of that platform co-op uh, to be able to use it. So everyone approaches it in a, in a slightly different way um, and there are advantages and disadvantages of, of both aspects. But Kaylee, I'll pass it over to you if you want to just comment a bit more on the case of Open Food Network, which is really fascinating and interesting. Um, I can comment on it from my perspective. I'm not a technical person. Um... Um, but the way that I understand it is some of the issues around the food system that we're seeing are access to land. And so I think from a philosophical point of view, um, believing in, in, in the commons is um, a belief that I think many of the Open Food Network share. So it kind of translates that, that open source technology being almost like a, a digital commons, um, that having that as part of our business or organisational um, ethos is important to us. Um, uh, but obviously that can come sometimes be... Uh, cause issues I think there's been a case of the software being used in the US um, by a, a big tech um, took the software but I don't know all the details of that case but it means that it's not that the software is essentially open for anyone to use um, and yet the in terms of our brand the open food network um, we we have a global team that's involved if any if any country wants to set up a new instance then that's a process that's kind of held by the the global team as a whole so our brand is is yeah it's, it's licensed you couldn't just set up an open food network without kind of engaging with the, the the whole community um but yeah um i don't know if that's been an interesting answer or not thanks Sorry. katie and also i would say you've got a lot of information on your website as well and you, uh, there's a community handbook as well where you can find out more more about that so um jen i don't know if you want to comment on this particular aspect or if you want to comment more generally on the tech um side of the challenges of tech <laughs> yeah ours isn't um open source but we did actually use an off-the-shelf um SaaS system so software as a sur uh, surface um to do ours and we've got future plans to move away from that potentially in future but it's quite a costly process for us as a relatively small platform co-op at the minute so when we scale the challenges will be quite different um, there's a lot of potential for us in the future. I always love hearing about um, Open Food Network because there's a lot of potential for scaling across um, whether we do it as more of a federated co-op structure with lots of smaller co-ops or whether, especially globally, or whether it's um, not. But in terms of open source, we'd like to collaborate a bit more um, in future. And we have actually got some um, funding to look at something around that as well in the future so I think those opportunities will become more um, apparent to, to the co-ops in the future. That's exciting, thanks Jen. Um, there's one more question that I just wanted to take before we wrap up. There's, do you know of platform co-ops that use token blockchain to manage ownership and governance? Um, so excitingly on the last uh, Unfound Accelerator, last year's ex um, Found Accelerator, there was a platform co-op that does use um, blockchain. Um, they're called pl the Platform DAO, um, and it's um, a publishing platform. Uh, I won't go into detail because it is quite complex. But what is interesting that's coming out of that is that we are developing um, uh, articles of association uh, that can be used by uh, DAOs, which are distributed autonomous organizations. So there's been a lot of learning through that process. And so as soon as we've got the template for the articles of association, we'll be putting them um, online. There is a growing interest from the DAO community towards co-ops because there is such an overlap. So I'm expecting to see more and more examples. Uh, we internally at Cobs UK don't have experience and knowledge of DAOs, but what we can do is provide what sort of articles of association can be mapped uh, onto um, a DAO. I hope that answers your question, uh, Jost. Um, let me see, I don't know if they have, uh, Jost is just asking for um, details. I don't know if they have an active, website yet yeah, let me just see any other questions before we we end 
just if I find the 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 website, I can email it to you um, as soon as I find it. Okay, any final questions before we wrap up? Great. So just to conclude, um, I'm just going to share my screen again. And uh, I also just wanted to say, if you hear of anyone who wants to set up a, a platform call, please let them know that uh, the accelerator will be starting uh, in April and the applications are open until the 5th of March. And do put them in touch with me. I'm always happy to have a chat with anyone who's interested in, in starting. And do check out Signalize and Open Food Network. Their, their websites, their platforms are really useful for, for anyone. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And thank you very much to, to our hosts, uh, to our speakers, and to Jen for helping with all the tech in the background. Thank you very much to everyone.